Okay, this is part two of chapter two. So this is just showing some of the pieces in a computer system. And again, we're focusing on, I guess it's not microcomputers anymore. This is the tower, the motherboard, disk drives. So let's see what some of the things we have to look at here. Again, the history of this, I hope we get a chance for everyone to watch a movie in this class called Pirates of Silicon Valley. There's a wonderful movie showing the history of basically how did Apple and how did Microsoft get started? Both two guys, both for under $2,000, both kind of starting in a garage or a dorm room. Pretty amazing stories. But a lot has happened over the last 60 years. So I'm amazed. I've been around to see most of this. And of course, I wish I would have invested a little more in the Googles and Apples and Microsofts of my time. But a lot of this, they've been breaking it into what we call generations. There are several generations of how computers have evolved. In the early days, long before I was born, there were what are called vacuum tubes. And you could see, you know, there's light on or light off, kind of like, just like a light bulb. And at the first of computers, actually, some of them should have not worked. Those vacuum tubes burned out fairly often. And then a neat invention came up called the transistors. Um, so the computers got a lot smaller, a lot cooler, a lot more reliable. And then IBM came around. What does IBM stand for? I would love in class to have a moment of silence and we all think of it, international business machines. At the time, around the third generation came around, this is when, that's integrated circuits. That's basically the chips as you know of today. IBM was, they were, IBM had more computers than all the other computer companies put together. They were the big blue, they were the big one. IBM was basically dominating the world and they made some really critical mistakes like letting Microsoft take off and own their own software, which didn't make any sense to the world. But anyway, so fourth generation, everything's getting smaller. Now we're storing things on CDs, compact discs and optical discs, lasers and things like this. Computers got much, much, much more capable and kind of the price went lower, 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 lower. So. Early computers took whole rooms. And again, this is just some history that you know a little bit about. Now in the fifth generation, parallel processing, that's when two or three or four chips are all working at the same time, like two or three motors on the back of your boat or your airplane. And a lot of things are happening out in the cloud now. So diff different generations and the three basic things, we, none of us can fathom the speed of computers anymore. It's just the, the speed doesn't make any sense and how accurate to the point zero 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 so and so many decimals and, and the amount of data we can store and retrieve just think if you ever pause and think about it, when you type into google something like whatever san diego padres schedule boom it's there for now for the next year calendar i mean they're just amazing storage and retrieval capabilities beyond any of our comprehension in terms of speed i promise i will not ask you this information but it is broken down into things like milo, micro, nano, and picoseconds. I mean, just think one, one, whatever that number is of a second. That's just, it's beyond my comprehension. <laughs> it's kind of like you just have to have faith. <laughs> it happened. So again, a small degree of inaccuracy could cause some big consequences. So a little teeny bit off can make a huge difference. So accuracy is really critical and it's amazingly good. And this is just it. Again, the amount of data that can be stored on something the size of your thumbnail is just incredible. Uh, an entire library like at Gosma College can be stored on something the size of a couple sugar cubes. So data is stored in something called a binary digit or a bit. So you'll hear it, see the word bits a lot. This stores a thousand bits or a kilogram, so many K or so many megabits or terabits or gigabits, a bit is a binary digit, one on or one off. So there's some coding schemes that have been invented to try to say, if it's on, off, 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 on, on, off, that's an A or a B or whatever it is. So again, as you read the chapter, you will see in more detail how this works. It's kind of hard to, to just lecture it over the phone. That's why I really wish we were in the classroom together and I could take more of your time and explain it in more detail. So one bit is just a zero or a one. That doesn't give us enough. But by combining eight together, that gives us 
between 128 or two, actually 256 different possible combinations. And if you look at the keyboard in front of you, there's 26 letters in our alphabet, and then there's 26 more if we do capitals and lowercase, about 10 digits, zero to nine, and then a, a smattering of special characters. That's plenty for us. Now it gets a little complicated when you want to add Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, and Russian, and a bunch of other languages. So nowadays we're starting to get more and more creative. But basically, every time you type a key on your keyboard, you're sending eight bits of data to the computer, or one byte. One byte. So a byte is eight bits, and that's simply one stroke of your keyboard. Now that's too little to track, so we start measuring kilobytes. K is for a thousand megabytes, millions, gigabytes. I'm not going to get into these petting and xing bytes, but you should know definitely what a kilobyte, what a bit, a byte, a kilobyte, or K, megabyte, or M, a gigabyte, or G. Those you should feel familiar with. That's just part of being computer literate today. So computers, what do they do? Basically add, and then they do logic. This is greater than, less than, equal, and then store and retrieve. So that's, and they're, of course, fast, accurate, and a massive amounts of data can be stored. And we'll look at some of the different ways. So again, you need we need input devices, we need output devices, and we need storage devices for this to work. So input devices, there's so many things from touch screens to trackballs and barcode readers and QR codes and reading your eyeballs and co optical characters like Scantron machines, reading the ink on the bottom of a check or in your debit card. So there's lots and lots and lots of lots of cameras, microphones, different ways to get data into a computer. Output, screens, printers, plotters. There's literally output devices that can print a house. Not the house you're used to looking at, but output devices. I want one that gives me a nice massage, you know, roller balls up and down my back. There's so many different output devices, large screens. Um, and then memory, that's just, there's two kinds. We say main memory, that's just temporary. That's what RAM is in your computer, R-A-M, random access memory. When you turn power off, it's gone. This is super, super fast. It can do a lot of things, and we need to have two or three windows open at a time. It's all in main memory. Secondary or long-term memory is what's still there when you turn your computer off. That's like when you save something before you turn it off, we call it secondary or long-term memory. Non-volatile means it's still there when power is turned off. And again, I know I'm going fast, but you can pause me anytime. That's fine. So what, they're made of silicone, and we have a wonderful movie. Maybe you'll get a chance to watch it. It's from Texas Instruments about how they actually build chips. How are chips built today? It's pretty amazing. Just see how that works. Again, RAM. ROM is, um, we do not write onto it. It's just there. That comes with your computer, typically. So there's several different kinds of these. Programmable and erasable programmable. Which seems kind of silly. Um, magnetic disks. We have magnetic tape. So some of you have seen in the old days like eight track tapes or long reel to reel tapes we still store that i mean we still store data on there but it has to be stored sequentially like for backing up we want to back up a lot of things um, a lot of data it can still be stored on tape it's very cheap it's very reliable and then a lot of things of course are stored on magnetic disks and usb drives um, hard drives solid state devices there's a whole bunch of different ones and again this is as i mentioned the most technical chapter a redundant array of independent disks. If I really want my data to be secure, when I save it, I'll save it literally on two or more different hard drives at the same time. So that way they call it for fault tolerance. It's just not acceptable for a bank to lose data. What if Grossmont College lost its data? They tell us what grades did you get? You know, what classes have you taken? Did you have money in our bank? You know, so it's kind of important to, in large systems in particular, not allow it to go bad. And then, of course, now we have to store a lot of stuff out in the cloud. So, again, I can be anywhere in the world and access my data in the cloud, like your email, like your bank account. You don't know where it's stored. It's just stored somewhere. Okay, we'll cover just a few more things. And there's some of the different kind of devices, the amounts of terabytes. And that, these numbers just blow me away, how much data we're storing today. So that's about 10 minutes. I'll wrap this one up now. And on this next slide... We'll just wrap this up, and this would be part two. I'll do one more part and wrap up chapter two. Again, this is 
of the whole semester, this chapter is the most intense. So there's different kinds of high-speed networks for connecting all this stuff and networks connecting other networks. So anyway, you'll get a chance to read about it. I'll pause here now.